Welcome to The Visible Artist. My name is Sophie Loxton Lucas and I'm so pleased you're here. This week I chatted to the artist Julia Vogel about her work in the public realm. Julia creates social sculptures and has done so many incredible projects. She's even given a TEDx talk about it. So if you're interested in working in public arts, then this is the episode for you. I've also never laughed quite as much as I have during this recording with other any other recordings. And I think that's just because, as you'll hear, Julia is so warm and friendly and generous in her approach and her ideas and her enthusiasm for everything she does. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am thrilled to be sitting here with Julia in her studio in Peckham. Julia Vogel is an award-winning artist who creates social sculptures and installations. Every work is cleverly designed to engage with the site and its community, both conceptually and aesthetically. To quote Julia from her amazing TEDx talk, which I urge all our artists to listen to, I make communities, sometimes as simply with a badge. I take the responsibility of building bridges between strangers with fun, colourful, interactive art. Because I believe art is not inaccessible, I'm driven to put the public back into public public art, and I enjoy fostering the potential between people and places. Often this takes the form of Julia asking members of the public a simple question. She then transforms the collected data into a visually impactful piece, sometimes taking over a whole public square. But her work goes way beyond the gathered data. Through her engaging approach, Julia is inviting people to share their individual stories, connect with fellow members of the community and feel the shared ownership over the final installation. Julia has been commissioned by New York Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Arts Council, Tate, ITV, Facebook, Hull 2017 City of Culture, Mayor of London, Welcome Trust Neuroimaging Centre and much, much more. She won the Aesthetica Art Prize and the Catlin Art Prize. I am so excited to be sitting here talking to Julia today about her thought-provoking work and her journey to this point in her career. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, it's great to be here. Please, could you describe what you mean by social sculpture? Yeah, so the term originally, I kind of borrowed it from uh, Joseph Boys mm-hmm. and in terms of relational aesthetics. But for me, it's really about making people, not necessarily artists, but making them participate in the work and the work generating and fostering kind of a connection and a social experience. So could you tell me more about one of those pieces, perhaps your whole city of culture work to illustrate what you you mean by that yeah no that was such a fun project um it was called scandalous blue who are you and i got to work with the volunteer group who basically was planning all these events for over two thousand individuals to partake in volunteering to help the city of culture throughout that year and they had this incredible database of information about all these people to make sure One, that everybody could get a uniform that fit them. And two, that they could find activities that matched everyone's interests. And I came in kind of at the end of City of Culture and interviewed the volunteers about their experience. And then using that data and the interviews, we colored this entire gallery, Humber Street Gallery, in their data. So I basically mapped the whole gallery in square footage and the percentage of people for the information about them, then became colored. So 1% were vegan. So about a square foot was vegan. Okay. <laughs> um, or we had 70% were women or, um, you know, 13% wore a shoe size nine, 16% had met the queen when she came to visit. So it was, it was both kind of social as well as facts. And then we also had quotes about them and their experience doing it. And they also came and helped me paint the entire room. Um, so over the course of the week, uh, we kind of painted it all together. So from everything from taking information about them, engaging with them, and then making it, it really was, you know, with the community. Did you have the complete concept already set out before you started? Or did you adapt as you spoke to people? So the, I should say there was a second part, which is that we I used colored sand. Um, when I was interviewing people, we did an event where I got everyone to bring in a jar from home and we used colored sand to make kind of the, you know, those things you do at cr- summer fairs or craft fairs where you <laughs> pour colored sand in to make a yes. landscape. Yeah. So we had colored sand and they were 
um, each color was related to another question about their relationship. So we did those and those were exhibited on the next floor. And I'd say I came at, they, the volunteer, um, group or city of culture kind of gave me all this information said, we have 2000 volunteers. Here's all the data. Here's the space. What would you do? Oh, yes. And I kind of came up with this kind of two phase thing because I thought the jars of sand would be a fun activity for the volunteers to do anyways, but also helpful for me to collect more information about who they were. And with that, I was able then to distill this bank of data that Hull City of Culture had given me. They gave me over, you know, 200 data points about them. Mm -hmm. And I narrowed it down to 52, which I guess <laughs> was not that close narrowing, but it was, it was it, that changed. So I think I came up with the concept of let's, this is the architecture of it, but the actual coloring in was really informed by the engagement. So to clarify, what was the final piece and does it live on now or was it a temporary piece for that year? So it was a temporary piece. It was one month. I think it was even extended for a few weeks. We painted an entire room, floor and walls of the Humber Street Gallery. Oh, hey, wow. And then the jars were exhibited on the floor above and those were all given back to the volunteers who made them at the end of the exhibition. So that lives on. Mm -hmm. um, somebody once said that my works are sort of like ghosts because they appear and they exist and people experience them and then they disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really lovely way of looking at it. I mean, do you ever mourn the passing of the project and wish that it was permanent or do you like that temporary element of it? Both, I guess. I, I really love that the piece is an experience and people have to see it. And I do think it lives on as an anecdote and in, and in that way. Um, I also don't have to store it. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not one of those artists who's like, oh no, I've just made another massive piece. What am I going to do? Um, but yeah, there are pieces that I would love to do again. And that is definitely one piece that just was so synchronous mm -hmm. in the making of it and in the aesthetic fanat like demonstration of it. Um, it was a little sad to see it go, but also it meant so much for the people who participated that that felt like enough. What I love about your work is that you're asking people to examine their identities, but in unexpected and playful ways. And the, hence the connections can be forged between strangers who wouldn't immediately be drawn to each other. Can you tell me more about that and projects that you've done with that approach? There's something that I've learned in, I can go back a little bit. Uh, I, I, I always loved art. I always loved making, but I grew up in Washington, D.C., which was a pretty political city. Mm. And something that I got involved with a lot is politics when I was much younger. And when I was 19, I went to freezing cold Iowa and I ended up knocking on doors for this candidate, Howard Dean, who was running for president at the time. And all these people kind of who didn't know me suddenly were like, why are you trying to solicit for a political candidate? But they all had opinions that they wanted to share with me about what they think is wrong with the country or what needs to be fixed. <laughs> and I started to think, like, this is great. People are hungry to share mm -hmm. with strangers. And it's much easier to do when you're not selling an agenda of a political candidate. Yes. And that really inspired my approach to why I make the work that I do. Because I think people are hungry to engage and to be asked questions I just learned recently that when people get asked questions, it releases oxytocin <laughs> in your brain, which is a drug of some sort. So I think there is this thing of people wanting um, to feel connected. And also people do that more openly if it's sort of um, awkward and funny and yeah. not as uh, maybe direct. And so that's sort of part of the the way I should kind of in encompass that so that maybe sounds sort of abstract but projects like pathways to freedom which i did in boston common i made like a lemonade trolley yeah and people would that. come that up to amazing. it <laughs> and they'd think i was selling candy or yeah. something they'd see this bright colorful thing and then they would get there and i was asking them questions about freedom and immigration <laughs> um and they were suddenly like oh my gosh this is this is pretty intense so i like the duality of using aesthetics and color and fun fair aspects and mm -hmm. games i use a lot of games to draw people in and then while i've kind of relaxed them in this fun environment then they feel more comfortable to share have they been quite unexpected results 
Yeah. I mean, the stories I get alone, you can, you know, fact is always stranger than fiction. Um, with the Pathways to Freedom project, we recorded 42 interviews. Actually, I think we recorded 100, but we only aired 42 of them. Um, and people could listen to them while they experienced the work on QR code sound bites. And it was really incredible what people shared about how they got to America or um, what makes them feel free. Mm, yeah, that does sound amazing. It's, your pieces are sort of have a dual audience, don't they? They have the people who are involved in the piece and contributing their stories or answering a question. And then, of course, you have the audience that views and engages with the piece. Yeah, I mean... I really wanted to make public art that um, could live on and could be accessible. That has been a main drive for me. And I, you know, when I was younger, I was like, if I'm going to do art, I have to learn all about the gallery world. And mm. I, I worked in galleries in New York for a summer and I just felt so isolated. Um, and then I saw Christo and Jean-Claude's gates in Central Park. And it just felt like a breath of fresh air of like, you can do something so innocuous of just putting color in a park and yes. suddenly people from all over the world are flying in to see something and it was free and it was a moment and it wasn't for the Olympics and it wasn't for nationalism. It was just for pure glee and seeing something different. Mm -hmm. And I try and capture that. So once you'd had that realization, what did you do next? How did you take your first steps into public art? Yeah. So my first steps really were at my university where the ugliest building possible, which was our library, it was a brutalist um, building, uh, was basically bought for, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio. It was, the Mud Library was built in 1971 off the drawings of a prison oh. that didn't get built. So okay. our school got it, the drawings cheap. <laughs> and then turned the interior into a library. <laughs> Having said that, the interior was decked out in crazy colors. The carpet changed every yard. There were those those kind of curved seats that you get yeah. into that are like shells. Yeah. Um, it was magical. But outdoors, it was complete brutality. Mm -hmm. But the front had 40 big windows. And I was like, what if we try and turn this building inside out? And I had just been studying in Florence where I'd seen all these cathedrals yeah. where the stained glass is always for the people indoors. You never get to see the stained glass outdoors. So it's like, what if we could make stained glass for people on the outside? So I roped almost every club on campus <laughs> into giving me like $25 or $50, <laughs> proving that this was art for them and convinced the library that by like literally coloring in a photocopy of a picture of saying, if I make this, you know, will you let me do it um, for two weeks and uh, dragged my friends in. I basically spray painted with stained glass spray paint, huge sheets of perspex, and then we put them into the windows. Um, okay. And that kind of was my first thing. And when I did it, I was like, this is the biggest piece of art that I'll ever do. Um, <laughs> and, I didn't know that was the beginning of sort of an addiction <laughs> to making really big work. Oh, that's an amazing story. And really impressive that you were so, sort of, you had such big ideas at university. Ah, oh, so this is, you're showing me your catalogue now, the library project. It's a really beautiful project. You must have been thrilled. With yeah, the result. yeah. I mean, it was a moment, I think many artists maybe have this where you make a lot of work that you're never sure about. And then you make something you're like, that's great. I'll never be able to do that again. <laughs> That was definitely that what what happened. But yeah, it was huge amounts of work. Mm. And I did feel a little crazy the whole time because you're beg begging people to, to let you do your vision. Yes. Well, you obviously had a really clear vision, but of course also needed to engage people, um, which is a challenge for lots of artists. Most artists spend a lot of time on their own in studios and your work requires you to be out with a lemonade stand talking to passers-by. Um, do you enjoy that element of your practice? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't do it if, if I didn't. People are like, that's torture. And I was like, oh, no, this is the best part. Um, it was really hard during pandemic when I saw lots of lines of people in front of supermarkets to not go up and ask them questions. I was like, this is great. They're all finally here in line waiting for me. And yet, you know, you can't get so close. And, yeah. You know. um, but yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, I, I feel like I learn most from people. Mm. And I suppose 
It's interesting you say that those lines of people, you could turn that into a project. I, I imagine there's an art to drawing people out and bringing them out of their shells and not just bombarding them. Yeah, I want to respect them. Mm. I, I really feel like if I'm going to make a piece, it should be something that isn't just fulfilling my fantasy, but is something that they'll yeah. get something out of it. And that if they're going to give me their time, I want to give them something back. And that, in reference to the badges, um, which I've done, Pathways to Freedom, they got a pin when I did Button Business, which I peddled around Krakow. And I've done a few other times, you got a pin. Those pieces are really a token of thanks to mm-hmm. say, hey, you gave me your time, you gave me your input, I'm giving you back something. And then they can take that with them and continue to to talk about those issues with other people. Every work you do has amazing concepts and ideas behind it, but also are just visually very impactful and incredible to look at, particularly when you've covered like a public square. When people look at it and simply just see that side of it and or maybe even call it pretty, do you feel like you have to jump in and explain it all or are you happy for them to just enjoy it? No, I mean, I think the best art aesthetically embraces you. Mm -hmm. And I definitely wanted to put aesthetics first because to me that was the lure to being in a to being engaged with something. And if you're interested, you'll dig deeper. I mean, there's so many historic paintings that I don't understand all the stories behind, you know, this king commissioned this, or this was <laughs> yeah. controversial, or this actually isn't just a naked woman. She's a, you know, nymph, or this is this mythic story. But yeah. you look at it and you spend a lot of time with it just because it's beautiful. And I think that's a great compliment. And you've created work in so many different places. Which one has been the most unusual location or the most unusual object you've worked on? I think I saw that you, uh, was that an old prison or something? Yeah. I mean, I got to work in Berlin, in Charlottenburg, which is West Berlin, um, in a former prison. Uh, And I got to make this, I don't even know how long it was, like meters and meters of drawing that that hung over these suicide prevention nets because it was an open oh, wow. three floor prison with these ramps and then people would look over the sides to see the ground floor and between all the floors they put these nets in so that if anyone tried to jump um from the cells they would you know and that in and of itself was uh really weird just because i was in the prison for mm-hmm. a week making it yeah um but it was also another vantage point of looking at something and thinking about history. And that was a really cool project. I've decorated trash cans. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I I think the stranger, the more interesting. I did a project Mm -hmm. in a cemetery. That was kind of amazing. Every place has history and has a community who's engaging with it now. And I'm interested always in kind of connecting the two. And how do you come, how do these projects come about? Do you apply for residencies on grants or or do, they, or do people approach you now? I used to just apply like a mad woman. And then I got some really good advice, which was that you should really only apply. There's only really three reasons I apply to something now. One, it's like the dream commission. Um, two, I know somebody who's judging, not necessarily personally, who I'd love to see my work. Because mm-hmm. you have to remember that every time you apply, even if you don't get it, somebody looks at your work. And that's a great boost of confidence to just say, hey, this person might see my work. Um and you might get it also, you never know. <laughs> um, and three, if um, somebody's asked me to apply and said, like, we think you'd be a really good fit, because that then gives me more motivation. Mm-hmm. So those still really are the three guiding principles. Um, more and more people are asking me to apply, which is really lovely. Yeah. Um, but I still am doing self-initiated projects, too. And I do apply for grants. And, I'm, you know, during pandemic, when everything stopped, I me and this other woman started working on a radio play, which came out of not being able to take over a physical space with thousands of people, <laughs> um, but still wanting to create something that could be about storytelling and access and that could be shared. And that's quite a departure from your work in terms of genre. Yeah. I mean, I also during the pandemic, I made a film <laughs> with screen printing on, on 35 millimeter film. I, I think it's great that you're here in my studio actually, because as much as I love making these epic projects, they sometimes take years to make. Mm. And I have always had a drawing practice, which informs a lot of like the color and the aesthetics of what I ultimately make. But you can't be that complicated on some of public work. So the departure for sound work is actually rooted in a lot of other projects that I've been doing. Home was a project I did in Peckham in 2012. 
and yes. we interviewed like 700 people about what is home to them and they could go in and put on headphones and listen to, to that. So Pathways to Freedom, we interviewed people. So the sound has always been another layer of inclusion and community that I love. Um, so it, it's a departure in terms of I've never done just a sound piece, mm-hmm. but it seems very fitting in my investigation. And you've been working on these installations for a long time now. How has how have you how has the world sort of the world that you're in, whether it's the art world or the cultural sphere, how has that changed in terms of um, people experiencing public art? Have you seen big shifts? There's t- maybe two ways to answer that. One, I think more commissioning bodies and funding bodies have gotten on board with the fact that engagement is important. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're willing to give money for creative engagement and public engagement. And that word is, is now is everywhere. Yeah. Um, and as a result, it's allowed more opportunities for me to kind of make work and make diverse types of work, uh, and take risks, but it has also impacted public's appreciation for work. And I think they are maybe harsher critics now (laughs) because they're seeing more of it, but they're also more willing to participate. Um, So definitely in the 10 years I've done this, not only has, you know, it been helpful to have commissioning bodies who can say, you should talk to her because she knows how to do this and this will be fun. Like City of Culture, 2000 volunteers came up to me. But even if I was on my own on the street, people are still more willing, I think, to engage knowing that it's art mm-hmm. and have more positive relationship to that. That must be really exciting for you, knowing that there's this growing enthusiasm for these sorts of projects. Yeah, and it and it does. I will say that there's a cultural understanding of that too. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I've mostly been working in Europe and America. I got to do a project in Hong Kong, which again is sort of its own world. So, you know, I don't know what it would be like I wanted to bring a project I was working on to Africa. Um, somebody's like, you'll get um, to specifically to Rwanda. They're like, you'll get arrested if you try and do that project. Wow. So, you know, I'm still aware that there, it depends on who is my public and who is my community. Yeah. Did, why would you get arrested? You don't mind me asking. Yeah. So the project was social protest, which is where I had these um, colored placards that look like protest signs, but they said nothing on them. Mm-hmm. And I invited people to say, if you could protest anything, what would it be? And there was a real nervousness about democracy. Uh, I see. Yes. So inviting people on the street to say, to complain about <laughs> things was sort of a taboo. I was kind of explained that it was maybe a taboo thing to do. Mm. Well, you've worked with a broad range of organizations, museums, public councils, corporate companies like Facebook. How did each project differ? Did you have to adapt your approach and method of working with any particular the organizations you enjoyed working with? Yeah, I, I'd say like every organization that you work with, if you're working with somebody else and it's not just your project, has a little bit of an agenda. Yes. Um, and I'd say like some of the more established cultural institutions definitely have expectations because they don't necessarily have a huge amount of money, but if they have prestige, mm-hmm. then they're sort of buying into what they know about you and they really want you to deliver on that, which on one hand is really flattering as incredible opportunity. On the other hand, can be limiting to do something new. And I don't like to do the same project twice, <laughs> which um, is can be infuriating, I think, for some commissioners who are like, can you just do that again? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but surprisingly, like I did this project for Facebook. I was really nervous about it. And actually the team that I worked with were kind of like, go for it. Mm-hmm. They gave me a lot more freedom to try something new and just engage. And I think the only thing that they limited me on was that at some point I had this color palette and they were like, that looks like Google. Can oh. you <laughs> can you stay away from that? So, you know, but they were, were much more open and not as censoring as I thought they would be. Mm, that's interesting. I would in some ways assume that they can give you more creative control, whereas public organizations have to I mean, they have to take a lot more boxes, don't they? Yeah. I, and it's hard. Like, I really commend public institutions who are leaning into art. I'd say the most difficult groups I've had to work with are hospitals. Mm-hmm. I worked with Vital Arts, who were an incredible oh, yes. yeah. organization. Um, Katsu Roberts runs that. And she invited me in to do, talking about strange places, to do a piece in a bereavement suite and a mortuary. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. So the mortuary was literally the room where people see the body of their, you know, loved one. Dead. Yeah. And I had to make work to distract them. If they wanted to look away, they could look at something <laughs> kind of calming and peaceful. Yeah. And that piece was, was not made out of community engagement, mm. um, but was more a kind of an aesthetic response to the environment. So I made screen prints from leaves on a tree that was in the hospital. But they have all the fire rating and, you know, it has to be not emotionally triggering and yes. it has to fit on this wall and it has to be washable. And and that has been challenging. Yes, I, um, I'm on the committee for hospital rooms. I don't know if you know that charity. Yeah, and they're great. It, it's amazing how much work goes into each of their projects. It's not just a case of the artist coming and putting something on the wall. They very much work with the patients that are in that unit and create something that, as you say, is not triggering, but it's also it's more than just a pretty wall. It's engaging and exciting. Um, but it, there's a huge amount of work and time that goes and planning that goes into these projects, but so worthwhile. Yeah. I mean, I think they do have huge amounts of impact and they're hard impact to, to regulate or to have any feedback mm. from. And one of the coolest things I did for Vital Arts actually was that in the bereavement suite, I made this freeze that we then ended up turning into a pattern of these bags that were given to any person who left the hospital to take the, the remaining things because it was we were told that people always took the clothes that they kind of came into the hospital with in trash bags. And those might sit in the back of their car or in their closet, which is sort of depressing. So at least we were giving them a really nice bag that they could put those things in. So if they didn't want to confront it immediately, at least it was something aesthetic and nice to look at. Yes. Wow. So you're really, that it's just such a personal moment to be a part of for someone's life. Yeah. And, and the coolest thing about this, just about feedback was that, they basically took the bags and then they would see other people sometimes on public transport having the yeah. bags and they would know, oh, you've also lost someone. And I was told this and I was like, oh, that's amazing. And sort of like the pins, it was like this, you know, total stranger, but you know, you've had this shared experience. Yeah. Oh, it's giving me shivers down my spine to hear that. That's really moving, I think. So I very much enjoyed your TEDx talk that you gave. How was that experience of presenting through TEDx? It was really nerve wracking. I don't know if people know, you have to memorize your speech entirely. It was 11 minutes long, which if you've ever, it's a long time yes, to memorize yeah. something. I would swim and be reciting it to myself <laughs> for days on end, weeks on end. Uh, but one of the coolest things about it is that they matched me up with um, someone from RADA and they gave me voice coaching. And I actually wish that like every academic or anybody who has to do, do public speaking can have that experience because they taught me about breathing and they also taught me about being really present when I speak. And that I think is a life lesson mm -hmm. um, that I was really lucky to be able to, to get. And so important in your work you need to be able to speak confidently and clearly to people communicate about your projects. Yeah. And actually it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I love being an artist, but at the end of the day, I really feel like I'm a communicator. Mm -hmm. Like I work in communications. And so what advice would you give to a recent graduate that wants to work in the world of public art? Get involved with other projects that are happening to get a better understanding of what's what it takes to make a public art project, but also get some funding and try something yourself. Partner with an organization, whether it be, you know, if you get funding, but when I did home, for example, I got the money from arts council and Kickstarter, but I went to Southern council and said, will you give me permission to engage with this community and to take over this site? Um, the same thing with Brooklyn arts council in New York, I had to get money from them on the condition that I would get parks and recreation to say, mm -hmm. okay, to using the park. And so I had to apply to both of them saying, it's going to work, right? <laughs> so I'd say, you know, you only learn by doing. And even if it's a small thing, just do it, you know, just like try it and, and you'll learn kind of on the job. Those names of organizations, those are prestigious, and I'm sure lots of artists would be quite intimidated to approach them with their own idea. Yeah, I mean, Brooklyn Arts Council, at the time, just to give pre reference, I love the Brooklyn Arts Council, but they're at the time in 2009, 
maximum would give you $4,000. Here at Arts Council in England, you can get up to like 15K or 30K Mm -hmm. as an individual artist doing a project. So they're already taking you more seriously. But Brooklyn Arts Council, you could go to them, meet with them, go over your application, and they tell you what's wrong. Same thing with Arts Council England. If you want to know how to make an application better, they will help you. And I'd say ask for help. That's maybe the number one thing I would say if you're graduating. If you don't know how to do something, ask for help. Don't just YouTube it and figure it out. There are people who want to help. That's really, really good advice. You mentioned before this conversation that you would love a TFL commission. Be one of those artists, Art on the Underground. And I can totally see this. Is there a particular station or location that you walk past regularly and you have your eye on? Kind of wish that you could create something in that space well i live near the new nine elm station (laughs) which seems hungry for art i'm sure tfl has already commissioned art that hasn't gone in yet but i love seeing kind of these barren spaces i'd say there's so many nooks and crannies in so many stations that i would just be happy to be on with i i did once have this idea so if tfl's listening um (laughs) that it'd be really amazing to have telephones that connect different platforms across Mm. different things and you could pick them up and hear voicemails that people would leave and we could have different colored phones for different phone different tube lines oh yes Um, (laughs) (laughs) so i'm ready (laughs) so yeah no i mean i guess that's a classic me answer to be like i don't want just one station (laughs) yeah like multiple (laughs) stations i just love transport and I I think I get some of my best ideas on a bus or do you have any favorite TFL installations that are already living in the stations yeah Palazzi has this incredible mosaic in the Tottenham Court Road yes. station and I know it was kind of controversial when they were refurbishing because mm. they were thinking about destroying part of it or how to protect it and I think they took out some parts and put it back in um, from a conservation perspective but it's so beautiful and you kind of walk through this rotunda as you get yes. from the stairs to the escalator going up that just feels special and, and just kind of a nice break from your day. It's interesting with public art like that, because I'm sure lots of people have been rushing past, but they are aware of it. They just don't maybe know what it is or they haven't even really registered it. And I'm sure that's something that you're aware of when you're creating your pieces as well, how people are moving through the spaces and how much they're picking up from the work. Yeah, It was really funny seeing Palazzi's show at the White Chapel Gallery a few years ago because there was so much work that I recognized that I didn't even know was his. You know, he did bronze, he did mosaic, he did screen printing. And for me, I was like, oh, this would be great. Like if I could die and somebody puts on a show and they wouldn't necessarily know it was my work, but they knew the work. Like if the work can precipitate me and my reputation, like that's awesome because it means I've made an impact in someone's life. You mentioned galleries, and I was wondering if you have worked with commercial sort of white cube space galleries and how that would work and whether you'd like to do more of that. When I graduated from the Slade, I was approached by a gallery who gave me an 11-page contract, of which nine pages were irrelevant to my practice at the time. And that was sort of a bing moment for me to recognize that I'm not really interested in commercial work. I'm interested in taking over spaces and making experiences And commercial galleries have a hard time selling that. Mm. So I've had sort of a conflicting relationship in that way of of appealing. Because, of course, I'd love to take over a gallery space. And Humber Street was so fun because that was a gallery space. And I I got to completely take over that, that space. But I do make a lot of drawings. I do do a lot of print work. I have not really pushed selling that work because I make it for myself a Mm. lot of the time. And I would love to have a show of of the works I've been working on because some of them could be commercial, but they sort of sit in a different place than my public art practice. And I think a lot of galleries want to show my public art practice. And I've been really lucky that I've been able to make enough money from my commissions to not have to make commercial components. But it is a it is a friction. Yes. Well, it's amazing that you're in that position that you can live off your public commissions, but you are then free to experiment, I suppose, with your other work. I'm looking around your studio now and I can see your works on paper and these works behind me. What are these? So these are on wood panel. They're using marker pens or paint markers, which I just discovered this year and I'm addicted now. (laughs) Um, And I've actually used those pens to make a mural on my sister-in-law's kitchen. (laughs) Um, But 
I love making work drawing and I do think that that feeds into my public work and I'm trying to kind of seep it in more and more. But sometimes I do feel like a bipolar artist. I think lots of artists do feel like that. They often have different strands to their practice and it's hard to know how to position themselves, particularly, yeah, if they're applying for grants and that sort of thing. But when I think about your mind, I just imagine wherever you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you have all these ideas just rushing around. And in a few years time, they'll pop up in some amazing uh, installation. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I would say I have 60 sketchbooks at home and I just opened the 60th to, like a few days ago. Um, <laughs> ideas hold, hold on. Sometimes not. Sometimes the time changes and things aren't right. But that has been something that someone taught me early on is just to hold on to all those ideas. You never know when someone will say, we need you to do something for, you know, this hospital or, you know, and you're like, great. I once was shortlisted for something and it didn't work out, but here, you know, <laughs> but in me fashion, I make everything bespoke to where it is and who it's for and, and where we are now in the world. So mm-hmm. ideas and frameworks sometimes always have to shift. Well, that's a great place, I think, to finish the idea of holding on to ideas. You never know what's around the corner. And um, thank you so much, Julia, for yeah, it's being been part really of this fun. conversation. <laughs> it's been really, I'm sure, really inspiring to hear about your journey and your ideas and your approach. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening this week. Please follow Julia at Julia Vogel underscore social sculpture and of course the Visible Artist podcast. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please do rate and review on Apple. It really helps and I love seeing your comments. Hope you have a wonderful week in the studio and see you next week.